Welcome to the Australian Law Reform Commission podcast. Hello and welcome to the third episode of the ALRC series about corporate crime. I'm Nadine Davidson Wall, Communications Coordinator at the Australian Law Reform Commission. And I'm Matt Corrigan, General Counsel at the Australian Law Reform Commission. As you know, the ALRC's final report on corporate criminal responsibility was recently tabled in Parliament. Today, we're here to discuss attribution. Now, first things first, what is attribution and how does it fit into the picture of corporate criminal responsibility? Well, Nadine, that's a great question because essentially attribution was the central question that we were asked to examine as part of this inquiry. And to understand what attribution is, we really need to think about what the criminal law was intended to do and how it was intended to operate. So traditionally, the criminal law was designed for individuals and the criminal law was not just interested in whether someone did an act, like striking someone, but what the intention behind that act was. And it was only whether, when that person had a guilty mind um, that the criminal law said that they should be guilty of an offence. So with a corporation, because they're a legal entity, it gets tricky. And so this is where attribution comes in as a mechanism to apply the criminal law and the rules of the criminal law uh, as they were developed for individuals to corporations. Okay, so when we say attribution is a mechanism, what does that mean? How does it work? Let's start with a traditional form- formulation from the common law. So attribution is not a-, a new concept. It's something that developed through the common law. So that's decisions of the courts over many, many years. And where the common law got to in the UK was the identification doctrine. And what that doctrine does is it it looks to find an individual that can be said to constitute the directing mind and will of the corporation. And that person, because they are the directing mind and will, is the person who through the acts of the corporation can be attributed. Now, whilst that might make sense in small corporations, the idea that you have um, a small business run by an individual, that that person would be the directing mind and will. We now have corporations that are much larger and much more complex. We have corporations that are larger than many countries. And so it's really much harder to think of any one individual in that context as the directing mind and will. So if we've got a multinational corporation, should it only be held criminally responsible for evading Bangladeshi export controls, only if the CEO in London was aware of those export controls and devise a strategy to evade them. Now, many people would say that that's um, not realistic. Now, the identification doctrine is just one of the methods of attribution. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. In fact, there are multiple inconsistent mechanisms for attribution across the common law and the Commonwealth statute book, which brings us to recommendation five, that there should be only one clear method of attribution which applies unless there is a particular specific case uh, where alternative uh, method of attribution is necessary. And this is really to say that if the corporation is going to be liable for the criminal law, as individuals are, that there really should be one test for applying the criminal law, not multiple. And that's the case as it is for individuals with the substantive elements of the offence. So given that there's so much inconsistency, has there ever been an attempt to implement a single method of attribution? There certainly has. Um, The Criminal Code was developed in the 1990s. Uh, The innovative work was kicked off by a committee chaired by Sir Harry Gibbs, who was a former Chief Justice of the High Court. The Criminal Code was designed to establish a uniform set of principles, not just for attribution, which is dealt with in Part 2.5 of the Code, but for the most fundamental issues of criminal law, such as what constitutes an act or an omission. It was seen as a radical restatement of the Commonwealth criminal law uh, in a single statute, and it was also designed to apply uh, across the states and territories as well. That sounds like quite an ambitious project. It was, and Part 2.5, which, as I said, was the aspect of the code that deals with attribution, was one of the most radical aspects because of its conception of corporate fault. So instead of sticking to individuals, which as I said with the identification doctrine, looked at the directing mind and will of the corporation. So it looked at whether that one individual had that guilty mind. What part 2.5 did was say, um, we have to look at whether or not the corporation itself was morally blameworthy or responsible for the criminal act, not just whether one individual within the corporation was uh, at fault. So if the Criminal Code was intended to introduce clarity and consistency, is Part 2.5 the end of the story? Does this solve the attribution issue? 
Well, uh, if, if it was, then there, be, there really would be no need for this inquiry and um, the answer would be solved. But the short answer is no. And so whilst part 2.5 at the time was a claim for its innovative nature and its conceptual sophistication, Part 2.5 was excluded from many of the relevant statutes that apply to corporations. So the Part 2.5 doesn't apply to the Corporations Act and the Competition and Consumer Act, nor the Australian Consumer Law. So different tests of attribution apply. So is it a problem with the implementation rather than the actual law? Why can't we just apply Part 2.5 across the board? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. The reason for the exclusion of Part 2.5 are not very clear. What we did as part of this inquiry is we went back to the explanatory material uh, for the legislation that excluded Part 2.5 to see if there was a consistent rationale or an explanation as to why Part 2.5 was excluded and why other tests of attribution were preferred. And our analysis is that there wasn't anything clear or easily to discern. And so it seemed to us that it, it may be as simple as familiarity on the part of legislative drafters uh, and policy makers rather than uh, any clear policy reason why part 2.5 was excluded. So it's not just a problem with implementation, there are issues with the actual law and the appropriateness of which test should apply and in what circumstance. And are we talking about the legal principles laid down in part 2.5 or is it simply the wording of part 2.5? We're talking about both but let's let's start big. So what our recommendations do, so we've got three recommendations regarding attribution. As we've noted earlier, recommendation five is that there should be a single method of attribution for corporations, unless there are specific reasons why that the standard test is not appropriate. The next two recommendations really then say what the test of attribution should look like. Recommendation six looks at what acts, so what are the physical acts of a person that should be attributed to the corporation. And in some cases, the amendments that we're proposing are about the words as opposed to the legal principles. Then we get to recommendation seven. And as I said at the outset, determining what the state of mind of a corporation is has always been the tricky part of attribution. And recommendation seven um, has, in this report, we've gone with two options because we do think that there are pros and cons of both options that we're putting forward and that it really is a matter for government to choose um, which one. One option adapts the existing model, which provides four ways of proving that the corporation had the relevant state of mind. Um, and then the second option um, then looks to another model, which we'll talk about later in the podcast, I think, around um, existing statutory formulations under what was then the Trade Practices Act. Matt, you mentioned four different ways of proving that a corporation had the requisite state of mind. Can you tell us what they are? So currently under Part 2.5 of the Criminal Code, it is possible to attribute the state of mind of a corporation um, in four different ways. Firstly, whether the Board of Directors um, had the requisite state of mind or made a decision in that regard. Secondly, whether a high managerial agent acting on behalf of the corporation had the requisite state of mind. Uh, and then the, the next two relate to corporate culture. And, and this is really what was so innovative about t part 2.5, the idea that you could find a corporation to have the requisite state of mind based on the, the culture. So it was looking at the organisation itself, not looking at an individual. And so uh, one option is to look at whether the culture contributed to the commission of the crime or could, the corporation could have been said to have authorised or permitted the crime based on its culture, or whether the absence of the culture was such um, to contribute to um, the commission of the offence. I see that the Criminal Code describes this class of individuals as high managerial agents, which sounds kind of intriguing, but what's the problem with the current formulation? Well, Nadine, I think there's a couple of problems with, with the term high managerial agents. Firstly, high managerial agents is not a term of art from the corporation's law. So it's not a person that is readily familiar with those who deal with the corporation's law, which is um, those who run and manage corporations. But secondly, the broader issue is that corporations, as I said earlier, have become much larger and much more complex. And 
The idea that there is a single person who could be said to be a high managerial agent uh, that could represent the entire policy of the corporation to us seems a little bit unrealistic. So our recommendation intends to better reflect the reality of modern corporate decision making. And um, to put it another way, we're not looking at job titles or job descriptions. We're focusing on the nature of the relationship between the individual and the corporation itself. So looking at the other option for recommendation seven, it looks totally different and there's no mention of corporate culture there. That's right, Nadine. The second option is based on on the statutory method of attribution, which comes from what was then Section 84 of the Trade Practices Act. And essentially, from our research, that method of attribution uh, applies to about 85 or 86 percent of the legislation that we reviewed. And so, in a sense, notwithstanding that the criminal code was meant to be the single source of criminal law, for corporations, most of those offences that apply to corporations would be attributed according to a test modelled on the Trade Practices Act, so not the, the criminal code. And that, that uh, method of attribution really does look to the state of mind of officers, employers or agents of the corporation. And so it is very much focused on the actions of individuals within the corporation, but not this smaller subset of individuals, as I, as I described, you know, either the identification doctrine or the notion of high managerial agent under part 2.5. So then how does it differ from the identification doctrine? I think that's a really interesting observation. What we are recommending in, in recommendation seven and, and option two that we're discussing now uh, has similarities with the identification doctrine, but in two very important respects is very different. Firstly, we are looking to attribute the state of mind to the corporation from all employees, officers or agents, if they're acting on behalf of the corporation, not just a person who can be said to be the directing mind and will of the corporation. And secondly, and in many respects, from our perspective, more importantly, our recommendation is that the corporation should have a defence of reasonable precautions or reasonable measures. And that defence is really important because it emphasises the moral blameworthiness of the corporation. The corporation should only be morally blameworthy and therefore criminally liable in circumstances where they have failed to put in place uh, reasonable measures or reasonable precautions to prevent the, co the commission of a criminal offence in the course of their business operations. Great. So you've summarised a lot about attribution, but is there anything else that you'd like to add about the ALRC's recommendations? Well, I think this is a really complex area, so I do think it's important that for those interested that they read the whole chapter. We've obviously touched on some of the, the key aspects of the recommendations. There are also a number of quite technical and discrete uh, reforms that we're recommending as part of that suite of recommendations. And I, these are designed primarily to re remove ambiguity, to provide clarity, uh, and importantly, certainty. Uh, and I would encourage people to have a look at those in more detail as well. Great. Thanks for that explanation, Matt, and for demonstrating why legal mechanisms of attribution really do require reform. Thanks, Nadine. It's been enjoyed being on this podcast, and I certainly welcome all listeners to read the final report, or if you're a bit short on time, the summary report. Uh, and of course, there are some excellent speakers coming up on the next series of podcasts.